Welcome back to California Edition on Brad Pomerantz. Of course, our guest is Andrew Carter. He is a member of the San Luis Obispo City Council. I was thinking of other council members, and I was like, wait, that's, that's Andrew Carter. That is not Dan Carpenter. Um, what's interesting about our conversation today is I expected to be talking to you as a candidate for mayor that's correct. of San Luis Obispo. I am not talking to you in that capacity because you recently announced you are not running for that office. That's correct. A huge surprise. It was a big surprise in the community, yes. What happened? What happened is I realized I, I literally could not financially afford to be mayor. I've served six years now. I realized I could not, as council, I couldn't re-up, if you will, if I were successful. Uh, for another six to eight years. They just financially could not afford to do that. And I want to talk about that concept uh, theoretically right. and literally. San Luis Obispo, you know, it's a mid-sized city, somewhere around 50,000, a little right. less, uh, considered one of the most beautiful cities in the state, if not the nation, or North America. Right. Uh, one of the happiest places on earth, pursuant to Oprah Winfrey. And so one would think that those that are shepherding the city would be well compensated. The city's doing well, no risk of bankruptcy like other cities in the state. Tell us how much members make of the uh, San Luis Obispo City Council. Council members make $11,500 a year. It's actually a cut. It used to be $12,000. Uh, uh, that's below the poverty line. Well, you can't afford to live on that if you don't have other sources of income. But for some, uh, like yourself, for example, who were hit by the recession, um, I mean, you all, you do have a spouse, so right. I, I presume that she may be bringing in some money. Right. Um, She's a clinical social worker, okay. so she so doesn't make both that challenged. much. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, is that unless you have another job, unless you are a trust fund baby, and I, I take no, I cast no aspersions on that, yeah. are retired or wealthy, that's how much money right. you're making a year. And I'm none of those things. And you're none of those things. Um, how much time do you put into being a member of the San Luis Obispo City Council? It's easily a full-time job. A, a light week is 30 hours a week. Uh, I regulate their weeks. I put in 60 or more. I would say the average is 40 to 50 hours a week. And why is it you need to put in so much time? Or do you, for that matter? Well, Are you that, just hyper-diligent? Well, I'm, I am a hyper-diligent person, and it, and it comes down to your personal sense of the hours you need to put in to, to do a good job. Uh, so there is some variety, but I'll, I'll just give, a, for instance, we had a council meeting on Tuesday. That council meeting started at 3, it ended at midnight. The packet for that council meeting was 638 pages long. Uh, I get over 40 emails a day, you know, constituents expect to meet with you, you need to meet with staff. Uh, because of the economy, quite frankly, there's a boatload of litigation. People are, see the city of Slow or any other city as having deep pockets. We're going through labor negotiations. It just adds up. Uh, we have regional committees that we're uh, members of. I'm a member of a statewide committee with the League of California Cities. It just adds up. I know there are some committees uh, that will pay council members to be a part of. Does that help with compensation? The, that's the minority, and at least here in San Luis Obispo County, it might be 100 bucks a meeting. So this is not. So it's not a significant source. Now of here's what's income. surprising, I think, for some of our viewers. If you look at the three counties in this area, uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara County, and Monterey counties, there are 27 cities. Right. How much are council members making in those cities on average? Most are making perhaps $500 a month. So four to six thousand dollars a year. So actually, at eleven five, uh, San Luis Obispo is near the top. There's only one city in the three counties where you're making a wage you could live on. Santa Barbara, it's forty thousand dollars a year, and that's just recently that they increased it to that. And what people may not realize, that is not the largest of the twenty-seven cities. No. The no. largest being? Well, in Santa Barbara County is Santa Maria, and then the largest in the three counties would be Salinas. And yet those members are making significantly Ten, less. Yeah, I would say in Salinas they're, and in Santa Maria, they're making in the ten to $12,000 range, similar to us. You know, I think of the precept, you get what you pay for. And if this is how we're compensating our elected officials, who are shepherding budgets of how much? I mean, San Luis Obispo, what's it? $100 million dollar budget. A hundred, I mean, I know you have staff, Katie Lichtig, a city manager does right. a fine job, but still, right. I mean, you're supposed to be the voice of the people. And the people expect you to be the voice of the people. Why is it that, in your mind, we as a democracy 
in California have been paying our elected officials so little? Well, I think it's because we've gone through a transition and the wages or what we pay hasn't kept up with that. So it used to be a part, uh, literally a part-time job. You'd have two meetings a month. Maybe you'd do a little a work the uh, weekend before that meeting. You come to the meeting, you'd make your decisions, and you, then you'd go back to your job or your business. But that's no longer the case in terms of the volume of work, and it's no longer the case in terms of people's expectations. In your mind, what do we lose by compensating city council members at a wage at this rate? Well, it restricts who is able to do it. So in California, the, most council members are retired people. Uh, you would have some that might have their uh, business that's successful that they can spend some time on. A few people like me who is a salaried employee, you don't have any hourly employees. So it, it just limits uh, the cross-section of people who can do it. And quite frankly, it also perhaps limits what their expectations uh, of what they're going to be doing. That, In other words, they're going to come at it if they're intelligent, and I haven't been intelligent, come at it, well, this is a, my job is caretaker. I'm not really supposed to proactively, I don't have the time to proactively jump on issues. My question then becomes, uh, could it be that there will be a sea change and that voters will start to recognize that maybe we are not paying our public servants what they should be paying? Or do you think this trend will continue that you know, let's vote the bees out and right. They're pay, we're paying them too much as it is. I think in some communities they'll increase the, the rate. Santa Barbara did it, and that tends to be a community that's active and involved, and uh, the citizenry is, and they understand the amount of work that goes into being council. I think most cities won't, because let's be honest, even I'm a politician, I don't like most politicians, so you don't want to pay them a full, a full time wage. But I go back to you get what you pay for. Oh, I most definitively believe you get what you pay for. And, and it's interesting, over the last four or five years, it's been very in vogue to have council members, assembly members, senators vote to cut their own pay. Right. I, I guess. And we did that here in San Luis Obispo. I mean, to what end? How much did the city it save? It was 12000 and we cut each person down to eleven five, and it was because of a similar pay cut that we were expecting of our employees. And so naturally, we felt that our full-time employees, if they were going to take a pay cut, we should take a pay cut as well. Which I understand. I mean, I, I see the methodology behind that. But I, I still go back to the question, if you're trying to recruit the best and the brightest to be leaders in a community, how do you do that? in an era where you're not paying, uh, you're ter I, I've said on, on the air that term limits has been an interesting experiment mm -hmm. that many people smarter than I say has failed. I mean, how do you... Particularly at the state level, right. I think it's disastrous. I mean, you, you talk about the notion of, you know, we don't want a career politician. I mean, I want a career doctor, I want a career dentist, a career lawyer. One could argue, why wouldn't you want a career elected official who knows what they're doing? Right. And there is a learning curve, whether at the state level or at the local level. There is a learning curve. And so you become more productive. I've been more productive in the, in the first two years of my second term than I right. was in the entire four years of my first. So what's next for Andrew Carter? Is he going to be running for re-election, or is that not possible? No. I, I had announced I was going to run for mayor. I, I pulled out. Uh, basically, um, I'm going to hopefully fulfill the final two years of my term, but I'm going to be pulling back in my time because I have to be earning some income. I've gone into debt uh, on council. What really sort of made me realize I needed to change things is when my wife and I started spending our retirement savings so that I could continue to pursue public service, and I said, you got to make a change. You can't do that. It's a parable. I mean, it really is in many ways. It's a metaphor. And I thank you for joining us. I thank you for your service. And I hope that uh, you are able to continue to give, at least emotionally, what you've been giving over the last okay. few years. His name is Andrew Carter, member of the San Luis Obispo City Council. I'm Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California.
Welcome back to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're still with us. Our guest is Jan Mark. She is mayor of San Luis Obispo. She's running for re-election. That election will be in November. And I just spoke with Andrew Carter, who is mm -hmm. a colleague of yours. He is on the city council. And he told us that he would not be running against you for mayor. He had planned to run against mm -hmm. you. Um, I know you're friends, and that happens in politics. Yeah. And the reason he is not running for election to the mayorship is because he said he simply could not financially afford it. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to speak specifically about Andrew, of mm -hmm. course, but I do want to talk broadly <laughs> about um, public service and the philosophy behind public service. The mayor in San Luis Obispo, one of the most beautiful cities in the state, do you make more than council members? Um, well, uh. <clears throat> I make right now about $850 a month. A month. Um, uh, but under the uh, city charter, I'm supposed to get $1,200 a month. Okay. And I took an 8% <clears throat> cut uh, because we were going to be asking our city employees right. to take a 6.8% cut. Right. And I wanted to lead by example. And I didn't feel it would be fair to ask them to do that if I didn't do the same thing. So suffice it to say <laughs> you're making maybe $10,000 a year. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. If I were earning minimum wage, I'd be in good shape. <laughs> right. And so that begs the question, uh -huh. which is <laughs> how we compensate our public servants. Mm -hmm. Look, we know that in cities like San Luis Obispo, nice mid-sized cities, there's a city manager. Mm -hmm. Katie Lichtig is your city manager. Mm -hmm. um, from what I know, she's done a very capable job. She is the professional. Right. That being said, mm -hmm. you are the mayor. Mm -hmm. And to think that the mayor is only making $10,000 a year, mm -hmm. I bet that would surprise a lot of people. I think it does surprise a lot of people, but I personally feel that it's a very good policy. I Explain, affirm that policy. Explain, please. Well, um, I believe that if you run for public office in this context in the city of San Luis Obispo, it's essentially you're motivated by public service. and. Uh, I, uh, for many years when I was on the city council, maintained my own solo law practice. And so I ran a full-time business. We've had other um, people serving on <clears> the <throat> city council who have their own <clears throat> planning business, uh, who are uh, professors at Cal Poly. Um, in general, if you're on city council, it, it's, it's structured in such a way that you can choose how much you put in, pretty much. But does that <clears throat> limit your pool? It does, yes. It limits, it limits the pool very definitely. But at the same time, um, you don't have people who are running for office because they're out of work and they need a job. Which, so. I, which I understand. <laughs> I do understand. But when you think about the pool, mm -hmm. You know, look, if one is an attorney, I used to be an attorney, as you mm -hmm. know. I mean, attorneys tend to be well paid. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you are better or worse than anyone, but attorneys are well compensated. Mm -hmm. But you know, you're doing important work as an attorney, but a teacher is doing an important work right. as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it'd be very difficult for a teacher to run for city council under a scenario like this. Although mm -hmm. I know Arroyo Grande as Karen Ray, for example. I mean, right. th th they're mm -hmm. out there, but you know, look, as I said to Andrew, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that to be pejorative, mm -hmm. but I, it can be troubling. Well, I actually don't think that it applies to this kind of thing. Right now we have a firefighter who is running for city council, a special education teacher, um, uh, a uh, professor at Hancock College. Mm -hmm. and the, an incumbent. That's the, and, mm -hmm. uh, that'd be John Ashbaugh. And then Dan uh, Carpenter, who is retired. He is retired. So, you know, uh, in terms of mayor, myself, I am retired. I retired when I was on city council and decided I was going to run for mayor. Mayor is just about, I'd say, well, it's about twice as many hours as city council. Which means what? Does it mean 40 or does that mean 80? <laughs> well, it, it varies. It, I'd say between 40 and 50. You know, I'm basically just working all the time. 
just like right. I do all the time. <laughs> now, I think about other Central Coast cities. Yeah. I think about Santa Maria, which I believe is the largest city in the Central Coast population-wise. I think wise. it's larger than, oh uh, yeah. Santa Barbara. <clears throat> and Santa Maria pays a wage close to what San Luis Obispo pays in terms of mm -hmm. city council. Santa Barbara, on the other hand, the population is smaller. It pays its uh, council members about $40,000 a year. Right. It's twice as big as San Luis Obispo. I mean, you could make the argument that um, uh, San Luis Obispo has about 45,000 people. Every supervisorial district has about 50,000 people. Right. You could make the argument that um, uh, city council and mayor should be paid you know, a living wage. Right. But uh, I really feel um, this city um, is 100 and almost 160 years old. It's always had really small um, salaries. I mean, let's look at the city of Bell, where they were paying themselves right. all this money. We could do that, but I think it would be a real mistake. But and Bell I, obviously is an outlier. Well, it was an, it was an right. extreme situation, and maybe San Luis Obispo is an extreme situation. But if you really want to give back to the community, and you're organized, and you're highly motivated, uh, you can hold down a full-time job and be council member or be mayor. At the it's a stretch, but it's possible. You know? In the 1990s, there was a wave of ballot initiatives imposing term limits yeah. on elected officials at all right, levels of government. Right. San Luis Obispo mm -hmm. jumped on that bandwagon. Mm -hmm. It appears um, people smarter than me have said that term limits may not be working as intended. Mm -hmm. especially in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. The voters are starting to sour a bit on term limits. One could argue in June they reformed term limits, allowing members to serve right. 12 years in one house, although it is down from 14 total. Um, San Luis Obispo's term limit formula is interesting. It's two terms and you must leave, but you can come back. Well, it's actually four terms for the mayor, because I have, oh, have a two-year, so it's eight years. Eight years, that's right. So you can switch back and forth between mayor and um, council member if people keeps electing you. Alan Settle did it for 30 years right. straight. But the question becomes, you know, should San Luis Obispo, like the state, is reevaluate whether term limits is effective for this city? Well, uh, you know, that's really uh, an interesting question. On one hand, from the point of view of someone who's been in public service, it really takes about two years. I'm now, I've, I've been mayor for two right. years. I'm going, I finally figured out what the job is. You know, and you have it to, takes, it well, takes a while. You, you are running for re-election. It's interesting why, I mean, why does the mayor have to run every two years? Well, this is what I'm going to say. Right. So that the um, electorate has the option if they feel city council is going in the wrong direction, they can elect the majority of the city council every two years. Every two years, they'll elect three out of five I people. understand, because the mayor is up every two years and then two. That's right. right. And right. so if it's if the Titanic is going in the wrong direction, sure. it can turn the wheel in the of other course. direction. So that's the plus side. Uh, the minus side is that uh, the mayor, it's, it's expensive and it's time consuming. Mm -hmm. You know, last time we met this Tuesday, we had mm. 648 page right. I, that, yeah, agenda. Andrew had said the same. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that doesn't count the economic right. strategic plan, right. which was another 150. Exactly. Um, and so if you're also, you know, running for office at the same time that you're carrying that load and you have to do it every two years, it is, it's like a Congress, Congress right. that also have to what same. about looking at this artificial limit mm -hmm. that after eight years, you're out no matter what. Mm -hmm. Can the mayor come back after eight years? After two years. After meaning they two eight years and then they have to leave for two years, then they can come back. I think, or they could run for city council. So, and then run for mayor two years And later. then run for mayor. Well, what do you think about all of that? I mean, is it something to evaluate that, you know, is this effective? Well, uh, it's, it's hard to say. Since there's such a big glaring loophole, if someone is really motivated and popular, right. they can, in effect, you know, right, keep running, give continuous service. Right. On the other hand, um, it, it, I think it just uh, keeps people accountable, mm -hmm. you know, to the electorate. Okay. And I think that's a good thing. Her name is Jan Mark. She is mayor of San Luis Obispo. When we come back, we'll be speaking with John Ashbaugh about homelessness in, on the Central Coast. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, John Ashbaugh, he is a member of the San Luis Obispo City Council, which is in the midst of a fairly controversial discussion debate over homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, in December of 2011, there was a survey in San Luis Obispo County found about 3,800 individuals are homeless. Mm -hmm. Many of them are living in the city of San Luis Obispo. That's Explain right. the challenges that presents for the city. It is an enormous challenge. It's something I've been wrestling with for most of the, the, the all really, of the four years I've been on sure. the council. Uh, and in, in part because I've also, I'm the city's representative on our Community Action Partnership uh, Board. Of course, we've spoken about that, yes. Yeah, they're the ones that provide uh, the homeless services for not only San Luis Obispo, but uh, they do case management services. Uh, they work with the Friends of Prado Day Center. Sure. Um, they staff the Prado Day Center. So they're in day-to-day -day contact with many of the people that have been identified as homeless. And here's the challenge. Uh, many folks who are homeless previously had been employed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, they did have funds to buy automobiles, for example, mm -hmm. and what's happening is many of them are living in their cars mm -hmm. and they're parking their vehicles on streets That's right. and that presents challenges for the city. It does. And let's all agree, first of all, that a vehicle is no place for an individual to reside. Uh, out in the open, is, uh, mm -hmm. it's a, maybe a little bit better than out in the open, but right. it's, not, it's not ideal by any means. You don't, uh, even if it's an RV, obviously a lot of people do live in RVs in, um, in, in, in mobile homes. Uh, there are regulated places where those can exist and the city does provide for those. We've got several uh, mobile home parks around the city mm -hmm. and several places that accept RVs, uh, but they're regulated in fact by the state housing and community development department. Um, we are not set up to accommodate or regulate the, that kind of uh, living accommodations on our public rights of way. And, and what's happened is the police department has issued citations. Yes. In fact, there was a big brouhaha back in January, excuse me, February, because over a three-day period, 21 citations were issued. That's right. And s that really was the impetus for what we are now dealing with, mm -hmm. which is how do we address these individuals who mm -hmm. just have nowhere to go. And to its credit, the Community Action Partnership staff stepped up and they said, let's take in, initially they wanted to accommodate up to 20 vehicles at the Prado Day Center parking lot, which technically it could fit, but we looked at it very closely and we said, now start with a pilot program, five vehicles here at Prado Day Center. And, and the good news is, is that pilot program is going pretty well. Yeah, it, it is. It passed it's, in March, uh -huh. and what we see is individuals can park there, but if they do, they have to agree to participate in a case in a management program right. they have to agree to participate in drug and alcohol counseling programs if I mean, there's a problem if yeah. there's an issue of course yeah. please yeah we we uh, we expect something in exchange not much but and certainly we're not charging them rent we don't charge them a dime for right. these services but what we do is we have skilled people social workers who know how to get these people into housing, supportive housing, transitional housing, an apartment, some way to get them off the streets, which is everybody's And place. as I understand it, Arroyo Grande has a similar program. Santa Barbara's had one for quite some time. Well, so uh, Arroyo Grande has They're, uh, they're has thinking about it. Yeah, it's, it's been approved. It just hasn't actually uh, materialized yet as okay. ours has. But now more challenges are presented. We yeah. know that a lawsuit was brought. Yes. Uh, with regard not so much to the Prado uh, safe pilot safe parking pilot program mm -hmm. but with regard to the parking on the streets yeah and a court for whatever reason I don't want to get too complicated tossed out San Luis Obispo's ordinance uh, it has and on the other hand it's now been <clears throat> that ruling has been uh, held in abeyance while we've been mediating with the group that, that uh, filed the lawsuit but the, he here's what's interesting is mm -hmm. that the City Council had before it an emergency ordinance to try to remedy the uh, issue that was brought That's forth right. by the court. And that emergency ordinance passed four to one. Yes. And I'm speaking to one. No, I'm the one that Why? dissented. Why did you vote no? I was uncomfortable with the emergency ordinance as it was presented to us. Um, numerous, there were 43 findings, specific findings associated with it. 
I was comfortable with maybe 13 of those findings, uh, but frankly, I, had, I, I, I did not have the time, frankly, to be able to identify uh, what the major issues were and where those findings, uh, I, I'd propose that we actually you know, go to work and, and, and look at these and do some uh, um, you know, wordsmithing on them. I couldn't get a second vote even to begin to edit those. So the, the content of the ordinance is really quite simple. And the principle of it is one I, I do endorse, and that is that we, we do need to regulate uh, overnight camping on our public streets and rights away. We just can't allow unlimited squatting, basically, on city streets. That, I don't think any city, any jurisdiction could, could possibly be. But there. as we speak today, it would appear that there is at least discussion going on between the parties to the litigation. That's right. Who, who was the plaintiff in the litigation? Well, there were several of them. Uh, five of them, in fact, that are, are working with the subcommittee of the council now uh, to achieve a collaborative settlement agreement but there. Was, it, uh, was there a, a blanket organization, the ACLU, or a homeless no. rights organization? There it was an ad hoc group that was put together that called itself the Slow Homeless Alliance. Because someone has to pay for the litigation. Well, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying to figure out how did this happen? They have a couple of uh, pro bono attorneys, but these attorneys are also seeking their fees as a result of uh, what they call the, the victory. Uh, public attorney general's concept. And does it help that they were victorious? I mean, is that well, going to be a hit to the, the They are general still fund? seeking fees for their work. Uh, whether we will pay those or not is an uh, a subject of discussion. And really, which way we'll go on that. Um, it depends a great deal, I think, on, on whether we're successful in getting to, yes, getting to an agreement that the city and these homeless individuals and our taxpayers and residents and business owners, everybody can live with. At, at, at the same time, the county government has been looking into this issue. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, the county is looking to build and uh, find funding for a homeless center on South Hegera mm -hmm. in city limits. Yes, in fact, we have the site. It's all, it's been approved. It's about a block and a half from the existing Prado Day Center, and it's right next door to the county's three-story uh, homeless, I'm sorry, the, the Department of Social Services. Okay, building, uh -huh. uh, On South Higuera Street, South Higuera, uh, near Prado Road. So that's, that site will be rolling out fairly soon in Is that in near September. what we know as the downtown strip or Thursday nights, it really? No. No, it's actually, like I said, Prado Road, uh, pretty close to the freeway. Uh, there are, are a lot of businesses around it. We're working very carefully with those businesses to mitigate the impact of this. And yeah, and let, let's talk about that because, mm -hmm. look, I, I think San Luis Obispo and the county as well, uh, fairly welcoming, uh, fairly forgiving, mm -hmm. but there is a concept known as nimbyism, not yes. in my backyard. Yes. And so, you know, the area you describe is not a bad area. Mm, I don't know. Um, and so how do you work with businesses who may be frightful that if you put a major homeless center for the entire county in their midst, that this could impact their businesses? Well, we already have a lot of homeless in this neighborhood. This, in fact, will, will, will put them in a facility where uh, they'll be less visible than they are if they're wandering around the street. Mm -hmm. That would be one argument I would make. Another is, this is intended to help these people get back into housing, so... Permanent goals, housing. That's right. That's, uh, what's, what's, what's more important than the shelter that, that we have on the, on the upper floor of the building uh, is what's going to take place on the ground floor. Uh, that'll be where job counseling, uh, mental health counseling, uh, the health services generally, drug and alcohol uh, will take place. Case management will take place. Uh, we'll also have a social enterprise function there. This is very important to me. I want to see some type of um, unskilled or low-skilled employment being offered to these folks so that they can, in fact, have some income by which they can better qualify for housing. So, sir, how close are we to seeing funding secured for the homeless center? We actually have a fair amount of it already committed. We have a $1 million grant from the state of California uh, and, and with federal funds as well. Uh, we've got a lot of private money that's being pledged. We're securing more money all the time and we'll be going out to the community to seek small donations okay. of any size from school children and everybody else. Okay, his name is John Ashbaugh. He's a member of the San Luis Obispo City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. We thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.